Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. For me in Perth, that is the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the third in a series of webinars reprising presentations from the Australian E-Research Skilled Workforce Present Summit that took place in Sydney in late July. Uh, my name is Matthias Lippis, I'm from the ARDC, and today I'll be joined by uh, Chantal Hoybers and Christina Hall, who will be uh, presenting. Uh, first up, I would like to introduce uh, Chantal Hoybus, who is the Training and Engagement Manager at EcoEd, and she'll be taking us through the very successful EcoEd training program. Over to you, Chantal. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um... Awesome, thank you. Um, so my name is Chantal Hybers. Um, I'm based at Griffith University on the Gold Coast. Um, but EcoEd is a training program that was um, funded and started by a whole bunch of organizations that work together um, to uh, outreach and engage with the community of eco-scientists in Australia. So this is really on behalf of, of those other organizations as well. Um, let me see if this is working. Yeah, so I guess um, not just uh, limited to the domain of eco-science, but um, uh, just as a bit of an intro, uh, predicting changes in uh, uh, wait one sec. Predicting changes in environmental systems is really complex and can go from um, small uh, uh, microbes to like animals, plants uh, and whole ecosystems. And to do this um, accurately and pro properly, we need a lot of um, data. And this data more and more comes from a whole bunch of uh, different sources and, and also is available in, in lots of different formats. So it can be uh, occurrence records of species, um, traits, um, anything that you can measure on a species, uh, but also like remote sensing data, uh, camera trapping data, acoustic recordings um, and so forth. And both in Australia as well as globally, we have a whole heap of uh, platforms and portals that uh, aggregate this data and provide this for users uh, to be used either in, in research or in education. Um, some well-known ones uh, in the biodiversity informatics domain in Australia is the Atlas of Living Australia that hosts uh, all the biodiversity data in Australia and TURN, uh, which collects standardized information about ecosystems. Um, but there's, there's a whole heap of others, um, and the logos shown here on the right is just uh, a collection of, a small collection of those. Um, and once a user or researcher has uh, found the data that they can use, uh, that they want to use, this can then be used in a range of different tools um, to run the analytics that are necessary for to answer the question, the research question that they have. So. In Australia, we have a couple of uh, virtual laboratories um, that uh, use this kind of data, such as the Biodiversity and Climate Change Virtual Lab, as well as the Marine Virtual Lab. Um, but there's also uh, other programs, um, and uh, as well as uh, discipline agnostic tools, such as R or Python um, servers that you can access in EcoCloud to analyze this data. And what we've seen quite a bit is that a lot of these tools do provide some sort of user support or training for their users, uh, but this is often focused on which button to click to run a particular analysis or um, how do I, uh, what do I do if, if something doesn't work or, or help, um, why did my experiment fail? Um, there is, uh, I think, uh, a growing but still relatively limited amount of scientific support available to use these tools uh, kind of in a sensible way. And while this kind of knowledge can be found in textbooks or publications, um, I think it's a, it will be a good um, service to, to users of these tools to provide um, sufficient scientific support so that uh, people can use the informatics um, uh, infrastructures uh, useful. 
this is kind of um, where EcoEd started. And to give you a bit of history uh, back in time, I'll start with the journey of um, ALA and BCCVL. So the Atmos of Living Australia and the Biodiversity and Climate Change Virtual Lab started a series of workshops for uh, training and user engagement um, about four years ago. Uh, and what we did was we ran face-to-face -face workshops across the country and internationally. Um, they were free at the time. Um, it was mostly uh, kind of piggybacking on, we're in a city, so why don't we stay an extra day and send out uh, an invitation um, to people in the, in the domain. And um, that got a lot of uh, positive feedback. Um, and a lot of people really enjoyed that these workshops were not just learning about which button to click, but a bit of the scientific uh, background behind what you can do in the tools. For the BCCVL, we kind of had a bit of a look at what that meant for how our users engaged with the tool. Um, so um, one of the things that we noticed was obviously uh, an, a, a dramatic increase in the number of users that the virtual lab had. Um, so we started with our first workshops at the end of 2015 and then our first undergraduate course um, kind of in uh, the beginning of 2016. And obviously if you run workshops then it, it's, it's uh, quite logic that you get an increase in number of people as well. So this graph wasn't really the most important for us. It's actually this second graph when we started to look at how they actually interact with the system. So this first bar uh, is what people kind of did in the system before we started any workshop. So in the BCCVL, you can run uh, experiments and uh, most of them are species distribution model experiments. And what we noted was that 75% uh, of our users uh, found the BCCVL were able to log in but would never run an experiment, which is kind of uh, uh, means that they don't really either know how to use it or, or don't come to it to use it. And for us, that kind of meant that we needed to guide them a bit better to how to use the tool and, and what it's useful for. Um, so about a year later, we have been running some workshops and started to do some undergraduate courses. We saw uh, quite a big decrease already in the number of people that uh, only ran zero experiments, so only logged in and never used it. Um, the orange bar, that's one to two experiments, is interesting, but if you run one to two experiments in a workshop, um, that will always be a relatively high number. I guess by now, and, and this graph uh, needs a bit of an update, given that we're almost at the end of 2019, but we see more and more people who uh, actually return regularly to the VL and not just run you know, a few experiments, but actually come back almost every half year when they have a new research project or a new question that they'd like to answer. And, and they come back and, and run a multitude of experiments, up to like 100 experiments um, for, for some particular person. So um, I think this graph shows that uh, training really helps with uh, uptake and engagement with your users. So this is where the idea for EcoEd kind of started. Um, and uh, this program was put together uh, at the start by ALA, BCCVL, and TURN. Um, and some of the aims of the program were really to uh, not just provide a, a, an ad hoc workshop for whoever wants to show up, but really start to integrate this more and more in undergraduate courses. Because what we heard a lot from the academics attending our workshops was that um, these tools are very good to actually translate some of the scientific concepts to the students by giving them like a hands-on tool in which they could immediately apply the knowledge that they learn in a lecture um, in an actual tool that is used um, by researchers as well as by government practitioners in the real world. So uh, we really wanted to educate and upskill the next generation of, of scientists and managers and develop a network of, of people. So a lot of the academics that know these tools or use it for their own research um, do provide a very good um, network of, of kind of our promoters um, 
and by having them giving them the the, the tools and the materials to um, to deliver these kind of workshops in their undergraduate courses, we would also increase the reach and the impact of the funding that we put towards developing these tools. Um, it's not just build it and they will come. Um, we, I guess we really believe in, in once you've built an infrastructure, you need to engage and train your community um, to make sure that they can use it sensibly. So ECOET at the moment um, <clears throat> has uh, a couple of modules. Um, so what we've uh, tried to do is put together modules that around a particular topic within, I guess, the data life cycle. Um, and each module includes um, or can include a lecture around a particular scientific topic and then has a uh, practical uh, tutorial uh, with a handout for students to actually run uh, an exercise in a particular tool. Uh, and then there's also a background information document for the teacher that really explains how you would set up um, a class or a workshop if you want to run through um, what we've what we've kind of intended with that module. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I guess to quickly touch upon each of the modules, um, ARDC put together a 10 Eco Data Things module that will build upon the 23 research data things that they did previously. We've picked out the 10 things that we thought were most important for eco science and um, really made all the examples and the activities in the uh, workshop uh, relevant for eco science so that it can easily be introduced in an introduction to ecology or conservation biology course. The Atlas of Living Australia put together a module around the biodiversity data quality using their spatial portal um, to really filter through biodiversity data, which is often um, uh, collected over a range of years and might not every record might be relevant for the question that you're trying to address. So um, using the spatial portal uh, is a very good way to actually filter exactly what you need um, and make sure that the data is fit for the purpose of your research question. Um, TURN uh, put together a few R packages to easier access um, uh, some of the data that they have uh, within TURN. So there's an OSPLOTS R package and their module includes uh, background information about this data and a whole R uh, exercise to actually ac uh, uh, access that data, visualize it and, and use it in some, um, in some an analytical kind of uh, in an analysis to kind of start um, exploring that data. Uh, BCCVL has a module around species distribution models and uh, how they might be impacted by climate change. And then uh, we also had um, the Australian uh, Government Department for Agriculture contacting us and saying, we have this tool that is used a lot by decision makers. Uh, it's a multi-criteria decision analysis. But this is a topic that's not really taught yet in undergraduate courses. Um, and they do run workshops, but often much more focused at the decision maker level and not so much on the uh, level of people that might um, roll into those jobs after their education. So um, ABES put together a whole module around multi-criteria decision analysis using the MCAS tool um, uh, for that practical uh, part of the of the module, um, and and we have received a lot of uh, positive feedback for that. And and I guess um, there's one there in the left corner that was put together by Galaxy. Um, so crossing a little bit between domains, between the bioscience and the ecoscience domain, um, they really like to show that through a module that's focused on environmental metagenomics um, and that really shows that that this kind of approach goes uh, across across domains. Um, so I guess what we've tried to do and, and we're uh, still working on adding more and more modules, um, we're currently working on some modules using EcoCloud, so doing more um, analysis in R, um, as well as looking into other portals and tools within this domain um, that might be of interest. So we're really trying to tackle um, the whole uh, scope of the data lifecycle from 
uh, understanding better how to manage data, how data is collected and aggregated, um, as well as focusing on tools um, that are developed for the an analysis of, of data. Um, as part of the EcoWeb program, we also started to um, train uh, what we call our EcoWeb champions. So um, instead of just having a handful of people that work for these tools going around the country and running these workshops, um, we wanted to scale up this program and make sure that we could deliver training at a, at a much uh, higher, like more, uh, at a higher level as in, in more people at the same time. Um, so we um, we kind of reached out to the people that uh, attended our workshops and asked uh, who was interested in uh, becoming a champion and and kind of act as a as an advisor within an institution. So these champions are mostly academics at a particular university in Australia, um, and they can also give us rather than just um, delivering the training, they can also give us feedback. Um, about you know how people interact with the system or what other features they would like to see. Um, so we so far have done two champions trainings um, with uh, 14 different champions from 12 institutions, and we kind of um, we supported them. So we funded their travel and accommodation to attend uh, a two or three day face to face training uh, event. Um, and what we did amongst uh, the organizations that provided the training, deliver co-branded teaching material. So the champions would receive this training material and in the uh, champions training, each of the um, representatives from each of the different organizations that put together the material would deliver this to them um, to really kind of explain to them uh, how to re-deliver this in their own institutions. And we also um, provide them with kind of uh, support after the training um, in case they still have questions or want to personalize this a little bit more to or customize it to the course that they that they use the training in. Um, I guess some of the things um, ending with a, a few of the challenges that we've come across and, and maybe the need for a program like EcoEd. Um, I presented our work to the Australian Council of Environmental Deans and Directors last year, and they actually noted that they um, reviewed the learning and teaching standards um, for this particular domain, and none of it, although um, in their skills section, um, they do um, uh, mention applying tools. There is no real mention in the entire document uh, about skills with regards to data or digital tools or technology and they really saw this as a, as a massive oversight and something that we should really think about um, teaching our students uh, uh, that these tools exist and also how to access and use these tools. Um, and I guess without that, um, we still do pretty fine because at the moment uh, we have over 15 universities across Australia and also some international universities that are um, using uh, these teaching materials. I was actually asked last month by uh, a university in Peru if uh, they're all right with them translating all the materials to Spanish. Um, which we could then also again um, provide on the EcoEd website. So um, the outreach will be will be even um, quite substantial through that. Um, so I guess some of the challenges. What we try to address in these modules is a very wide range of topics that include very discipline specific topics, ecological models and climate change projections. Uh, might be quite um, specific to the ecology field, but at the same time, we do address things like uh, spatial data, uh, how do you work with um, uh, biological and environmental data, how do you manage your data, make a data management plan. So we kind of uh, cover a lot of topics that address both discipline specific and discipline agnostic topics. Um, and at the same time, we are um, both uh, teaching people that have never heard about these uh, concepts or have never used any of these tools 
um, two people that are quite um, expert at using that. So some people are uh, an expert in using R uh, in their own R studio on their computer, but have never used it through cloud compute or are very um, uh, skilled in using spatial data through either ArcGIS or QGIS, but have never used it in, in a tool um, like BCCBL. So, so we're kind of covering um, both the novice to expert as, a, as well as a different depth of um, topics. Where we would like to go is um, to really focus with EcoRed on the more discipline specific topics. That's what we already do, but work more and more together like what we did with AIDC and the 10 EcoData things um, to generate some materials that are based on discipline agnostic topics, um, but then kind of tailor that for um, maybe the more domain specific um, uh, topic or for more with more domain specific examples. Um, so we're really thinking about um, talk, talking more to the discipline agnostic uh, organizations like the Carpentries and, and other organizations that provide this kind of training. Intersect does a lot of training on Jupyter Notebooks, which we have in Eco Cloud. Um, so how can we really um, work better together and not keep reinventing the wheel on, on some of these things? Um, I guess just to end with what we've seen in, in developing a program like this, some of the challenges that we've had is um, besides the coordination that we would like to increase with the other providers, um, funding is always a bit of a, a question mark. Uh, do we fund this as part of platforms, which would uh, really make sense because you can't develop a platform without providing support for it. At the same time, um, the, it might be a program on its own. Um, we would like to make our materials more fair, so have uh, almost standardized metadata around what's this module about and what could you use it for, um, rather than just having ad hoc files. Um, having them more online rather than in downloadable files would be also very good. How do we measure impact? Um, that was a question that I got asked by one of the collaborating organizations. They need to report on how often is it used. And um, even though I have quite a bit of contact with the academics that are using our materials, um, I also do know that there might be universities using it without us even knowing. And how can we uh, provide more recognition for people that have either um, participated in a particular workshop or in the uh, champions training um, so that maybe they can use this as part of their as part of their degree. So these are things that we would like to work um, with other training um, initiatives in Australia on and um, something that is kind of on our agenda to look at for the next um, next years, I guess. Um, so yeah, that was kind of what I wanted to share about our program. Um, I'm happy to, uh, I don't know if we take questions now or at the end, um, but happy to discuss if you're if you're interested in either using the material or becoming a partner organization. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Chantal. Uh, we do not have any questions for you at this time, Chantal. So we might uh, move on to Christina. So uh, Christina Hall is the uh, well, as it says on her title. Screen there, Training and Communications Manager at Australian BioCommons. Um, take it away, Christina. Thanks very much. So today I'd like to introduce to you a scalable model for delivering dispersed bioinformatics training that we've been working with and we call it hybrid training. So within uh, five years, we estimate there'll be more than 30,000 Australian researchers across agricultural, environmental and health sciences that will either be bioinformaticians themselves, or they'll be researchers who use a lot of bioinformatics driven techniques, or they'll be researchers who are wet lab focused but will rely on um, online resources to interpret their research. They'll increasingly be interacting with both local and global resources. Um, they'll have diverse data needs and they will certainly bring a variety of skills. Um, and I'm going to place this training technique that we've developed within this context of um, responding to those needs. So 
The EMBL Australia Bioinformatics resource was a distributed research infrastructure network providing bioinformatics support to life science researchers throughout Australia. And it was set up as a collaboration with EMBL EBI to maximise Australia's bioinformatics capability. It was hosted at Melbourne Bioinformatics through a funding agreement uh, between the University of Melbourne and BioPlatforms Australia. Now, one of the successes of the EMBL ABR was that there was a group of 13 nodes around Australia who came together to participate in um, shared training activities. Now, at the conclusion of EMBL ABR this year, we're continuing to work with that great group of institutions and researchers as a vehicle for the continuation of a national training program within another BioPlatforms Australia funded initiative, and that's the Australian Bioinformatics Commons. So the Australian BioCommons project is asking the big questions around uh, what infrastructure and activity is needed to support Australian biologists to do world-class science. And in terms of BioCommons training, we've really hit the ground running uh, by leveraging what was built as part of the EMBL ABR, and I'll describe that training methodology that we've refined over a couple of years now. So, we, um, there was a range of activities, uh, things like providing a central point to find out about bioinformatics training, and we also had a webinar series in collaboration with the ARDC. But what I'm going to talk about is our live hands-on training workshops that took place uh, both last year and this year. So the hybrid training method combines the advantages of webinars with the advantages of in-person group training. So we needed this method to uh, efficiently share training resources uh, across our network. It was actually inspired originally by a failed roadshow that we'd organised for a fantastic trainer from the US uh, to come to Australia and unfortunately uh, she applied for the wrong visa to travel here and we found out a little bit too late to do anything about it. So to salvage some training opportunities for our nodes, we cobbled together the beginnings of our hybrid training method. So when I talk about that, what I'm meaning is that we have a lead trainer that delivers hands-on workshops via video conferencing. And at the other ends, we have participants gathering in training rooms that are always supported by facilitators locally. So what they do together is then work through um, tested content that's been specifically created for that forum and uh, with um, pre-prepared data and tools and compute to support the activities. So far, we've worked across a few various uh, different platforms. We're experimenting quite a lot still at the moment. We've had a lot of people, five different trainers, work with us to develop new materials. We've had a whole raft of volunteer facilitators, and they've represented lots of venues around Australia. I've got a list here of institutes and organisations who have put their hand up to participate in sometimes all of our training activities, uh, other times uh, just topics of particular interest. So, the hybrid training has three roles within it. The um, lead trainer is the person who's responsible for the content creation. So we approach experts in their field uh, with a, a topic that they would like to uh, develop up some new training in. Once um, we work with them to develop training that will fit the hybrid methodology and we run through and test that content with them. We also can um, help them to ensure that the compute and the data and the analysis platform will work on the day um, for their proposed activities. Now, these events always rely on local facilitators. They are in-room helpers. We uh, make sure that they're all adequately trained. They spend time with the lead trainer um, ahead of the public event, and sometimes they actually assist the lead trainer in developing the content. Um, they're also our uh, person who deals with logistics at their various venues. So they do room bookings, they do local um, advertising, and they're responsible for the success on the day. They welcome people to the room, uh, they make sure people are keeping up, they encourage them to interact um, via the Zoom chat window and um, also a discussion board, which I'll talk about later, and they set up the live feeds we have into their rooms. Now the coordination is uh, 
a, a role for the Australian Biocommons. We make sure that um, all the planning ahead of time and the resourcing is adequate for the day, the, the event to be a success. We reach out to new facilitators and we make sure they're trained and confident in taking part on the day. And we also assist with advertising materials. We advertise nationally. Uh, we um, set up and take the registrations and communicate with participants ahead of time, making sure everything's a hit on the day. And after the event, um, we uh, undertake the evaluation surveys and report back to each of the venues uh, what happened and how it was received at their venue. So this is what the events actually look like. It's a mix of um, talking and uh, providing time for, to, for participants to actually do things themselves on their own laptops as they'll have to be able to do when they leave the workshop. So we stagger each workshop with catch up points and we also monitor each of the rooms to make sure that everyone's on board and everyone's keeping up. And if they're not, we actually pause and wait for everyone to continue on together. So the lead trainer uh, here, we have a lead trainer from last year, Anna Syme. She's in a room by herself. Uh, the lead trainer is never in front of a, a, a live audience, but that person is concentrating on delivering the best they can for everyone watching without any distraction. Our last two events have had over 150 uh, registrants uh, logging on at the same time. So it's important that the lead trainer has every one of those uh, people's needs in mind rather than just the immediate needs of someone in front of them. Um, having said that, there is one person in the room with our lead trainer. We ensure they have a buddy that sits with them to alert them to any problems that are going on at the various venues. So there might be a change of pace required or a question that comes through that, may, that requires immediate attention. So there's a person in the room who can give them a, a little tap on the shoulder and let them know what's happening if need be. Now, ideally, that person is also an expert in the field of the, of the training that's being undertaken, and they can get on and answer questions immediately without interrupting the, the trainer's presentation. Um, and so on the right side of uh, this slide, you can see uh, the view that the, each of the rooms get. There's one big screen in each room. They see the presentation that the trainer is beaming out. Uh, at the top of the screen here, you can see Anna's speaking head, so they can always see the speaker uh, delivering the training. And then there's uh, various other rooms, uh, they can see each other, it really engenders a, a sense of community that they can see other venues all around Australia taking part in the same training activities. So we encourage constant discussion via a discussion board. That's actually just a Google Doc that all participants uh, can interact with. They can interact with each other at other venues, with the facilitators and with the lead trainer at times and domain experts. So we have usually a, a, a bit over 90, um, a, a, usually about 90 simultaneous users of um, the discussion board. And that really provides a great opportunity for participants to ask questions that are specific to their own um, research or to um, you know, ask extensions on what's being presented in the training on the day. Here's just a, a snapshot of a couple of venues um, from a training activity. On the left here, we have um, a small group gathering in uh, at Melbourne Bioinformatics. And on the right is a larger group. This is actually Monash Malaysia campus. Now, when the request came from Monash Malaysia to take part in some of our training activities, we weren't sure that they were really within our target audience. But the beauty of this method is it's really low cost to bring anyone on board. So we said, uh, why not? Um, and that goes that that sort of mentality goes um, the same for if an isolated group in a rural university, they might have two people sitting in a room. It's really easy just to bring them on board and have them participate. So the things that we really love about the hybrid method is uh, the discussion board. We think that's a real success and we can get some really fantastic um, discussions going there and that continues on after the workshop itself is finished and um, uh, it lives on forever. So if people want to consult um, the discussion board again, they can go back and see the answers um, that they got um, forevermore. Uh, 
initially we didn't have uh, specifically people sitting watching the discussion board ready to answer questions but over time we've realised it's such a great resource for people to have access to um, uh, ex people with a lot of experience that we always make sure that there's people who can answer the hard questions watching the discussion board ready to go. We use Eventbrite for uh, managing all of our registrations. It works really well. Um, some of the facilitators want to know all the details about who we're registering. They want constant updates. I can share the, the permissions for their particular event and they can keep an eye on you know, the questions the answers to the uh, registration questions that are coming in or tap on their colleagues on the, on the shoulder if they think they should be attending and haven't registered yet. Other facilitators don't want to know anything about the registrations so I can just provide them with the reports ready to go before the event starts. Um, Eventbrite's also really nice at managing a wait list. A lot of the times our venues have significant wait lists, but we always have people who drop out um, in the week in lead up and sometimes in the day before the event. And Eventbrite allows us to quickly offer those places uh, to the next people in line and, and to maximise attendance. Uh, as I said, it's really easy. Once the event is set up and ready to go, it's really easy to offer it uh, to further venues to bring new people on board as long as they have a, a facilitator who's available locally. Uh, and we really feel like the administrative burden uh, is borne by uh, the organiser, the buyer commons in this case, uh, whereas we can make it easy for people to bring training into their institution that wouldn't have otherwise happened uh, while we do all of the, the, the boring side of organising it for them. So there are some limitations of the hybrid method. At the moment in Australia, we're working across four time zones and that limits the amount, the length of time that a, a workshop can go for. So it's usually three to four hours and that short format will uh, by necessity limit um, what we can hope to achieve in that time. Um, we also have uh, patchy uptake. We can only reach into venues where we can identify a local facilitator. Um, and sometimes, uh, we'll have a facilitator trained up for one topic and the next time uh, there won't be a taker there at the same venue. So we'll have to train uh, new facilitators and that new sourcing of facilitators, their training and the loss of knowledge how the events have run in the past and the expectations we can have of each other. Um, it can be very time consuming. We also know that uh, we struggle with volunteer fatigue like everybody. People are very busy in their normal day jobs and um, sometimes we can't rely on the same people to put their hand up every time. So the BioCommons training goals is to foster a collaborative community of highly engaged bioinformatics training specialists who are keen to participate in future national training initiatives. So we know for that to happen in a sustainable way that we need to be able to identify the right people and we need to reward and recognise their contribution to make that a, a sustainable uh, endeavour. So what's happening now? Um, at this point we have a really well documented standard operating procedure. We have our processes uh, nicely laid out. We share those with um, lots of people who ask about how we do business. Um, we've got templates that we can share with people and we're going to wrap all of those into a, um, a paper that's in preparation at the moment. We're also working on new workshops this year. We've um, just recently run the first half of a new phylogenetics trees workshop. Before that um, we uh, were working um, on an, another two-part workshop on bioinformatics workflows. Uh, and uh, we're having further conversations with uh, what's in store for next year. So the University of Tasmania, uh, University of Adelaide, CSIRO have been partners who have developed content with us this year and we're really looking for new partners who have something they'd like to share uh, for next year. So um, 2020 sees a very ambitious plan for us for national training events and we're interested really in partnering 
at all levels. So where there's an opportunity to develop good materials and an opportunity to deliver it to where it's needed, um, that's where we want to be. So please contact us if you have some good ideas to share about bioinformatics training. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Christina. Um, so uh, I think Chantal, if you'd like to turn your video or your microphone on, we can move into uh, question time. Um, okay, so we have uh, one question already um, for you, Christina. Daria Vinichkina from the Sydney Informatics Hub um, just wanted to confirm what you use as your discussion board platform. I believe you said you use a Google Doc for that? Yes, that's right. We're currently using Google Docs, um, but open to suggestions if um, people have used other things. I, I know some, some people use Etherpads. Um, we find it works okay. We've, we've not had any issues with it so far. <laughs> um, I'd actually um, like to um, ask you, Chantal, what is it that you use to facilitate the communication between your champions? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, we started with something that's called Basecamp. Um, that was a few years ago and I'm, I kind of felt that was just a new thing for people to add to their long list. So I'm not sure if we, we haven't really continued to use that. Um, and at the moment, because in the last year we haven't really had funding to run EcoEd, it was kind of done a little bit as part of other programs, uh, we haven't really looked into a new good solution for that yet. Um, probably Slack would be an option. I think Slack these days is is a good way of communicating with groups of people. Um, and and yeah, and we don't have an EcoEd Slack channel yet, but I can foresee that that is probably the way to go. Okay, thank you, Chantal. Uh, Christina, uh, Susanna Bacon from the ARDC asks um, or, or says uh, that uh, some of your methodology sounds like it's inspired or sorry, sounds like it's similar to the Carpentries. Did you take any inspiration from the Carpentries methodology? Hmm. Um, I would like to think so. So we've, we've a lot of our trainers uh, trainers who have done um, carpentries um, training themselves um, and obviously there's a lot of advantages there um, in terms of face-to-face um, -face training. Um, so I would say yes there are very much factors that are inspired um, by carpentries um, style training especially given right. that most people who are interested in bioinformatics training have exposure to the carpentries because it's a, it's a great method in itself. Great, thanks. Um, now I did, uh, I, I personally have a question for you, Christina. Um, so you, um, you know, one of the key components of the hybrid training are these local facilitators that you identify and train up. Uh, but you mentioned that these facilitators are um, already domain experts or um, know about what is going to be trained in. Uh, is there any room for, because I'm looking at the attendee list, we have a few librarians in the list. Uh, and I was wondering if there is any scope or room for non-domain experts to help facilitate hybrid training for the uh, institution. Mm -hmm. I have also been wondering myself um, exactly that question. After attending e-research recently, um, I had some wonderful conversations uh, with um, library staff who had been engaged in uh, training activities. Um, I'm thinking now about the Tinker project. Um, and it really did open my eyes to the scope of perhaps broadening out um, the role of facilitator to people who are already skilled in um, engaging uh, with broad audiences um, to train them up in particular skills, but that m those people might be outside of the bioinformatics community. Um, so I think there's actually really great potential um, 
for that as a, a path, a, a different path of engagement. Um, because I, I do believe uh, a lot of the materials really lend themselves, uh, don't require a domain expert to be standing in the room when you have a lead trainer who is an absolute expert and in a forum where interaction with that person is possible, um, each of those local facilitators might bring different skills other than expertise in the, in the subject matter that's being taught. So yes, that is something I would like to investigate more. Okay, great. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, now we have a couple of comments from Daria Vinichkina. Uh, so one is um, going back to how uh, trainers or champions can stay in touch with each other. Uh, Daria mentions that there is already a Slack that is shared between research trainers uh, in Australia. Um, so she suggests, Chantal, you might like to just hijack that for your own purposes. <laughs> Um, invite people to join that. The enriched one, yeah, we could have a channel on that, for example. Uh, and sorry, Chantal, go on. I said that must she must be um, pointing to the enrich one. Yes, that that's my assumption yeah. as well. Uh, and yeah. for anybody who's tuned into this uh, webinar, I can share the link for that uh, community of practice when I send out the recording uh, probably next week. Um, oh yes, Daria confirms it's the Enrich one. Uh, another comment from Daria. Um, so she um, shares that um, they've had non-bioinformaticians help out with a snake make and some of the workflow tools at Sydney Informatics Hub, uh, although apparently this was accidentally and not by design. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think specifically there were HBC staff involved in that one. I think that's what we're talking. Yes, that's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Daria just confirmed that. Um, now I had another question. Oh, wait, yes, I remember now. Now, Christina, uh, and this goes for you as well, Chantal. Um, so, but Christina, you especially mentioned that you already have procedures and templates and workflows in place that you're happily sharing uh, with others. But I was wondering if you'd be interested in making those things a bit more fair mm. uh, and, and uh, making them entirely public so that other people can um, uh, possibly contribute or, or reuse them without necessarily having to get in touch with you. And Chantal, the same goes for you. You've got your champion program. Uh, and I'm sure others would be very interested in um, your processes and, and workflows in how you manage that. Any sorry, so, any responses so, to that suggestion? Yeah, so for EcoEd, all the materials that we share with the champions are openly available. So, um, so any any person who would want to use EcoEd materials can download that from the EcoEd website. At the moment. That's a Google Drive folder, and I am in the process of putting that into a GitHub pages um, so that students, especially academics who use this in an undergraduate course that they run every year, I would rather have them go to a GitHub pages that's up to date with the tools rather than using the same PDF file from last year that might have some changes in it. Um, so that material is openly available. How we run the champions training itself as in the trainer the trainer component uh yeah that's a good question i'm i'm always I've, i have shared you know our kind of um learnings and challenges with the has community who did a similar champions uh, approach um and i wonder if i wrote that up somewhere they plenty of people have said it would be great if you can just write it up and have it somewhere available um, we haven't really gotten there yet, but yeah. That's where we're at as well. It will be written into a paper and and deposited somewhere that everyone can share it widely, but that we're still in that process of writing up. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that you both have ample free time to be able to do things like this. <laughs> no. <Sure. laughs> um, all right, now uh, we have no more questions left, although Christina and Chantal, I wonder if you have any questions for each other. <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot. 
I did have a question. I don't know if it's personal, but um, I noticed the, that there was a, a point on uh, your presentation, Chantal, that was about fully funded champions training. Now, I know that our training, when you're flying people in from all over Australia, can be very expensive. Does fully funded mean you paid those people for their time? Because I know you also had quite senior people in that room as well. Did you, if you had them for two days, were you paying their time or just their travel expenses? Just travel accommodation and food, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they give us their time. Um, mm -hmm. So far the feedback has been that they think that's very valuable. Uh, yeah. But even so, even um, even just providing travel accommodation and food can be quite expensive. So when I presented to the Australian, uh, what is it, Council for Environmental Deans and Directors, uh, that was that's 25 representatives from 25 different unis, and they actually said that you know the universities that don't have a champion yet, they were like, oh, why are we not on the list? And we'd be happy to try to find resources to um, send the champion, you know, if that would be the limitation for us, if we say we only have money to do eight or 10 champions, they were like, well, if I pay for my own champion to uh. get there and have accommodation, you know, would you be able to feed them? So eventually I would want to, through, through that kind of council, reach out to all the universities and actually say, look, we're having a champions training, but we can't really provide accommodation and and travel um, but if you want your university to have a champion send them here I actually yeah. do think uh, a lot of the universities wanted to be part of the program so yes um, it, it's kind of you know trying to find a way and and also even the facilitators um, so our time was kind of funded by our own organizations so you know mm. we just get in and rock up it's, for some people it's part of their job but for a lot of others it's also um, kind of, you know, just giving their time. So yes, yeah. it's an in-kind contribution to supporting the program, and they they Absolutely. feel that the contributions yeah. worth the exchange is valuable enough to make that contribution. Yeah. 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 Mm, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, we would love uh, to do a hybrid model for EcoEd, so yeah, that's something we would definitely be, especially now we have champions at 12 different institutions, we can actually run a hybrid training where, you know, if I would be the trainer, I could be online and we could still have those those rooms set up across the country, so yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes, once you have a, a stable community of trainers, they're ready to go with the training, it, that's a, a a big step forward. Yeah. Talk to me anytime you like. <laughs> yeah. uh, also been dabbling in hybrid training myself, although admittedly it was to one remote site. So I was in Perth and the room in Adelaide had a local facilitator. Um, mm -hmm. but that, went, that was extremely successful. I was really happy with how that turned out. And I think this hybrid training model is something that any uh, training organisation or, or trainer should strongly consider. Uh, mm. to help scale up their activities. Mm. Uh, now, we do not have any more questions. Um, so uh, Chantal and Christina, I'd like to thank you both very much for your time. Uh, it was a fantastic session today. Um, so uh, this now was the last in the series of webinars following the Australian E-Research Skilled Workforce Summit. Um, so uh, please keep an eye on the ARDC events calendar for future webinars. Um, we are getting into the tail end of the year, so things might start tapering off a little bit, but we'll certainly be back uh, strongly uh, in the new year. So thank you very much for attending. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.